God bless you very much. God bless you. Good evening, friends. It is a trip. Thank you. <laughs> that just makes me feel double welcome. And so nice to be here in Arizona tonight in this city of Phoenix and this lovely tabernacle with this fine fellowship, which I've looked forward to coming back since I was here last. And a few days ago, it was mentioned just before I went overseas that the possibilities of coming back to Phoenix, that none of the brethren was coming in this time. Well, that sure made me feel good to know that I get to see my friends again out here. And while I was in Puerto Rico and in the, the Caribbean islands, why, then uh, when I returned, I heard then that we was coming out here, and it certainly was a great privilege to get to come back. It always seems good to me when I come down across the mountains and see those deserts blooming and flowers beginning to come after battling the snowstorm for four days and then freezing up and coming down here where it was nice and warm. It's just a little touch of heaven. This valley always has had an attraction for me since I was a little boy. Remember my first visit to Phoenix? I was just about, well, I was about 16, 17 years old. It's been around 30 years ago. And up on 16th and Henshaw was a desert. <laughs> That's where I stayed. Up just right out on an old country road. Rode down along an irrigation ditch coming into Phoenix. That's how I got down from the Henshaw Road coming into Phoenix. All gravel, just an old gravel road coming here. Certainly has changed. And there's people has changed. The valley has changed. Phoenix begins now at Apache Junction coming this way. It will continue to change if time goes on. And that's the way we find everything in life. It changes. I've only found one thing that doesn't change. That's God. He doesn't change. I found him around 30 years ago. I was running from him when I come to Phoenix. But there's no need of running from him. He knows where you are. And so then, but he has never changed and never failed to remain the same loving, sweet Savior that I have, that I found. The only thing in me, it just seems like he gets more dear to me each day as it goes by because I'm getting just a little closer to him. My life's running out and I'm not the little boy I was a few years ago, but there's one great hope that I had that someday to return back to that again, only with immortal life, never to die. A few days ago or some time ago, I might say, I was combing what few hairs I had left. My wife said to me, she said, Billy, you're almost bald-headed. I said, yes, it was caused to start with from a barber putting carbolic acid on my hair. It all come out and then it never did come back right. I said, but honey, I want to tell you I haven't lost one of them. She said, pray tell me where they're at. <laughs> I said, well, I will answer you if you'll answer me. She said, all right. I said, where were they before I got them? They were bound to be a substance somewhere. And wherever they were before I received them, they are there waiting for me to come to them. Someday this... That is exactly right. <laughs> Not one hair of our head, but what's numbered, God knows all about it. I sit out... A while ago, looking out to Camel's Back Mountain, and I remember as a little boy, I rode a horse out there. Well, I used to work up here above Wickingburg, went up with him to bring cattle down. I often wondered how, if I could ever see a time that I could ever be that 17, 18 year old boy again, but God's Word teaches that I will be. There's nothing that God loses, He'll raise it up again at the last day. He promised that, Jesus did. And then we're knowing that this life, no matter whatever happens in this life, all of our homes, our big city, our fine nation, this fine state of Cal... Uh, I better not say that, had it. The water rights are human. <laughs> Arizona is, um, will fade and go away someday. 
All of our homes in this valley will be dust again. But our souls has immortality. When we're born again of the Spirit of God, God promised to raise us up again at the last day through His Son, Jesus Christ. And then we would be young forever. We never have to be sick no more, never have no more heartaches or sorrows. What a time that will be. When he said in Revelation 21, I saw new heavens and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth was passed away, and there were no more sea. That's the one we're longing to go to, striving to go to, and around the world as I go preaching to the people, praying for their sick and afflicted, meeting my fine brethren of every church and every denomination, having great fellowship, uh, uh, looking forward to the time when I shall meet them to never say goodbye again. Yes. Today I was standing in um, the caf- Miller's cafeteria, and the man who was taking care of the meat back there knew me. Then the boy waiter said, Hello, Brother Branham. I sat down and I met my friend, brother and sister Norman, and their people from Tucson. A few moments, an elderly man and woman come up, and this lady, when they introduced themselves was from Oakland, came over and go to be here for the meeting. They're probably present tonight. And she received, as I understand, the Holy Spirit two years before I was born. She's been, been preaching for 41 years, I think it is, the gospel. When I see people like that, and she said, there's only thing, one thing that worries me. I wish I could get out and keep going. My, I, I felt just about that big standing beside that woman to think of an old saint, oh, aged and still, all that's in her, something cries out, more God, if I could do something for him, should make us ashamed of ourselves. We should go right out into the field, start doing something for the Lord Jesus. I want to thank our precious brother here tonight and the board of this church for inviting us and bringing us out here so we could associate and have great fellowship together, trusting that God will give us a great meeting. I think it's about 15 days. My, can you put up with me that long? <laughs> That'll be about as long as I ever held a meeting in my life. It'll be 15 days. As long as meeting, I usually just stay three to five nights and gone. We was in Puerto Rico last week, or week before last, it was, I believe. We was in Kingston, Jamaica, and... Having about 3,000 converts each night, and went to Puerto Rico, was there about three or four nights, went to Puerto Rico for two nights, had three to 4,000 each night there coming to the Lord, and here up at Phoenix now for 15 days. My, I just trust that the Lord will do something great for us. And because of our coming together, I trust that it'll cause a revival, a real revival over the entire Maricopa Valley is here, that there will be a revival in every church and everywhere there will break out the Spirit of God of love and fellowship that will be on its way to bring Jesus Christ, the Son of God, back to the earth again. Upon those thoughts, before I take a text, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Now, before we pray, would there be any like to be remembered in this prayer, if they would just raise your hands up to God, inside or out. He sees and understands. Keep your thought in your mind now as we pray. Our most gracious Father and God, who brought again the Lord Jesus from the dead, raised him up on the third day and presented him to the church as the only mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, him leaving this most wonderful promise to us, that if we ask the Father anything in his name, he'll give it to us. It would be granted. So we come before thee tonight, Lord God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, thy Son, to ask that you first will pardon us of every sin and every trespass that we have did against thee. And if we have sinned against our brother, or against our neighbor, or anyone, may the Holy Spirit reveal that to us at the beginning of this revival. 
that we might go and make these things right, that we might have clear hearts and clean hands and undefiled conscience before Thee, that Thou could send us to the needy, those who are indifferent about God. Our testimony would not be hindered, but the great Holy Spirit would go before us and help us to bring people to the Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you'll bless this church and its pastor and its board and its members. Bless the body of Christ that's in the valley here, the members of every church. And we pray not only for this church, but for all, that there will come a great revival. And that the glory of God may be felt throughout the valley, not only through the valley, but around the nations. And bring the Lord Jesus as we see the time approaching. We ask, Lord, to remember those that are sick and afflicted. The shut-ins tonight out in the hospitals and the convalescent homes and around. Let thy Holy Spirit, Lord, minister graciously to them through the name of the Lord Jesus. Give unto us of thy grace thy love, and give us thy word, Lord. May the word each night be planted into our hearts and the Holy Spirit water until we become real statues of God, members of his body, bringing forth love in such a measure that it would be so salty until all the phoenix would thirst to be like those Christians. <coughs> For it is written of our Lord that he said these words, ye are the salt of the earth. And we realize that salt is a savior when it contacts. May we live such lives till our spirits will contact others and make them crave to be the people and live the life that the Holy Spirit lives through us. Bless thy word as we read it tonight. And we pray that you'll establish it in our hearts. For we ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus, thy son, Amen. <clears throat> Waiting and out, inside and out, around the walls, we are know what it means to stand cramped. And it may, may stand a long time before the services start, so each night I'll try to hurry just quick as I can. But yet... I want to give ample time for the Holy Spirit to let the Word work, take its place in the heart, so that, you know, eternity is a long time. It never did begin or it never will end. We drop down in time, but we'll be lifted into eternity one of these days or nights, and it will determine what stage of that, how we live here, what our... our outcome will be there. So let us be real deeply and sincerely of every moment that this would be the last message we'd ever hear in our lives. I have chosen for a text tonight found in the book of Isaiah, the first chapter, the 18th verse. And just for a while, after I read it, I pray the Holy Spirit give us the context of the word. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. I thought that would be a very appropriate thing to start out the service with tonight. And I want to take the text, if I should call it a text, of conferences. The prophet here has been called to God, said, come and let us reason together. Let us just have a conference. We've heard so much lately in the last few years about conferences. And what are conferences for? What's the reason for conference? Uh, usually, a conference is held in a time of an emergency. 
when an emergency arises that the, the armies or whatever, is, if it's a, a conference of that type, that the big man, the leaders, could get together and, and swap their ideas and reason out things and work the best that they could for, their, for the, what they were working for. The cause, the purpose. Many in here can remember a conference that I have in mind tonight was a few years ago when they had what they called the Big Four Conference. The Free Nations was come together and held a conference because that they was an emergency. At that time, Germany was just about to take England and the, the world as it was. There was a state of emergency. And the big four powers of the free world met together and, and they was trying to come up on some idea, something that they could put their uh, hands on, that they could change the strategy to, to know how to win that war. I remember a, a minister friend of mine was in Louisville, and he was listening to the returns. Usually when they have a conference of that type, the whole world was focused upon the outcome of that conference, because the whole world was involved in it. Usually, if there's not anything to your interest, Involved in the conference, why, you don't care about it. But let you have some interest in it. Then you want to hear the returns, to hear what's taken place. This minister friend of mine was listening to the radio, and he was just walking the floors, listening at the speech. And he said someone knocked at the door, and it was during the time that when we were having rough times. You couldn't have sugar in the coffee, and well, we complained about that, and had to borrow the coffee the second time, and we complained about that. Sometimes I wonder if we don't do a little bit too much complaining. When we think of having to borrow the coffee twice and complaining about it, and man dying on the field. Young American blood being shed on the field and blood of the nations poured out. And then we complain about some little sacrifice that we have to make. It, it seems like that, I hope this doesn't seem uh, wrong, but we seem to be more or less an ungrateful people for the things that we do have. We don't put the valuation through the things that we do have. And this minister was pacing the floor and someone knocked at the door and he went to the door to see what was going on and there was a, like a modern beatnik there, you know, with his whiskers all over his face and dirty and he said, I, I'd like to talk to you a little while. I said, I'm a poet and no one will buy my poetry and you're an influential man in the city and I feel if I, you'd go down and Give me a little sand off of people to buy my poetry. And he said, my dear man, won't you come in and sit down just a moment? He said, I'm hearing the returns of the results of the Big Four conference. And the young fellow wasn't interested in a conference. He's only interested in his own poetry. And he wouldn't even listen to the minister, to the minister had to take him to the door and make him sit on the porch until he had heard the returns. Because he seemed the only thing in life to him was to sell this poetry that he had written. And then we could think of a, another conference. There was a, a Geneva conference. We all remember the Geneva conference. How that they selected that beautiful place. I've been there several times and it's uh, certainly a pretty place in Geneva. And the Geneva Conference. And the results of that conference. 
And then recently the Paris Conference. We remember the great Paris Conference. Another great uh, historical marker. And then now our own beloved President Dwight Eisenhower. He's visiting the free world. Conference after conference after conference. Khrushchev, he's also out conference after conference after conference. Why? Because it looks like that there is a state of emergency coming on. The world is in such a shape till any little nation could destroy the whole earth. Men are has achieved by his scientists uh, and by his scientific researches and he's got beyond gunpowder and poison gas. He's got into hydrogen bombs and nuclear weapons and so forth that they could rise a submarine up out of the ocean somewhere and destroy the world. And everyone's getting afraid. That's why they're holding conferences trying to get together and find out what we must do. God also has conferences. God holds conferences when an emergency arises. Let us look into some of those conferences. The first one that I can call when an emergency arose was we would call it the Eden Conference. When word reached heaven that God's children had fallen, there were immediately something had to be done because his own son and his own daughter had fallen from grace. And there was a case in the stage of emergency if man ever existed. There had to be something done. I can imagine God our Father down in the Garden of Eden looking around to find a certain tree where he could call his children up in his presence under this tree. He selected a place and he called that conference and he stood Adam and Eve and the serpent and there was a conference held. They had trespassed his laws. And his laws were just and must, the penalty must be paid. And how are they going to live after the death sentence hangs on them? And there was a conference held. And there was a propitiation made for that sin. And temporarily until the woman's seed was to bruise the serpent's head that would pay the full penalty of sin, there was a lamb sacrificed until that time to be fulfilled. And there was something that was achieved. There was something done that was great. A way that man could be saved again. I'm so glad that they had a conference. If they had no conference, where would we have been tonight? There was something done. Agreements was met. And bylaws was made. And they went forward. And that first conference meant the difference between life and death to the human race. And then let's call another conference. There was a time when there was a prophet that knew the Lord God as his Savior, and he had misbehaved himself and tried to do it in his own way. May I stop here just for a moment to say this, my brother or my sister? Any time that any person ever tries to do God's word or will in their own way, they need a conference right quick with God because they're wrong. There's only two ways to do anything that's right and wrong. That's your way and God's way. Your way is always wrong. Moses found out that 
His way didn't work. And as Moses learned the hard way, so have I learned it that way. No doubt but many of the people here tonight, sitting here or standing here, has learned it the same way. It's a hard way. It's best to surrender your will to God's will and hold a conference with Him. And when we find out that Moses, in his great schooling and his intellectual learning, smart, intelligent, he was so shrewd till he could teach the teachers. I'm not trying to support ignorance. But I think that when we get that way, we're in the most dangerous stage we can get into. When we get so smart that we know more than everybody else. That's has what's the matter with the world today. That's what's the matter with the nations today. Each one's trying to get smarter than the other. That's what's the matter with the people today. We're trying to outsmart something. We're trying, to, even in our churches, to see how greater steeple we can build. The better classes, we call it, to get in. The better dress taking away the real jewels and nuggets of the gospel and compromising upon them instead of the altar, a handshake. Instead of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we compromise to a handshake. Or a baptism by immersing to the sprinkling of some water. Anything to get our own plan in it. But it will never work. Never did work and it never will work. God's way is always right. Amen. Got to be His way is the only way. Moses and all of his great military mind and how that he could achieve, he thought murder was the, the question. Our murder was the way and he slew an Egyptian. And his very beginning, he found himself defeated. I might say this. There's a many minister tonight in the land and in other lands and many Christians tonight that in their heart they really want to serve God but they find themselves defeated because they take their own intellectual conception of the gospel. Just join church or do some good thing or give someone some clothes or do a little good deed. If that's all that it took, then the Eden conference was in vain. And the death of the Lord Jesus was in vain. God laid a program down and we've got to come to that program. And sooner we get to that, the better the church will achieve the purpose of God when we get to God's program. Moses tried to work it out in his own way. And he found that he was wrong. And by doing so, like many others who backslide from one revival to another, going up and trying to impersonate a Christian or standing and making some kind of a sign or, or some uh, a declaration of creed that we si recite, we find ourselves in a few days defeated because we're trying to do it in ourselves. It'll never work. We must meet God's program, yeah. word by word, letter by letter. See, anything that you try to do, the intellectual mind is so contrary to the Spirit. The intellectual mind thinks it has to be smart and wise. The Holy Spirit is humble. Break down all you ever know. Walk sweet and humble before the Lord. Loving Him with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. There's where the Holy Spirit works. Make you do things that you didn't think you ever would do. It'll make you repent and go back and shake hands and make up with people. That you could join church and still call yourself a Christian and hate down in your heart. But you can't be led of the Holy Spirit and do that. You can't do it. You can't You can't cheat. You can't lie. You can't pull shady deals. It's got to be out and above board. 
The Holy Spirit's approval on it. Moses tried, but he failed. God had called him, and there's no doubt, in the hearing of my voice, there may be many people that God's called the same way. But we tried to appease that by joining church or doing something religious. It'll never satisfy. You need a conference with God. So Moses, God determined because he'd elected him to do so. He wandered in the desert and one day on the back side of the desert, God decided to call his runaway prophet and he selected a certain tree. I've always wondered, wonder what he put on that tree that didn't burn up. The leaves were popping and cracking and the fire burning and I don't know how long it burned. But it didn't burn. It was God's selected place to meet his prophet. God selects the place to have his conferences just as the kings and the rulers of the nation select their places for conferences. God selects his place. My honest prayer that your seat tonight or your standing place is God's selected place for you. And He can talk to you, speak to you, do something or say something that would attract your attention. And He could hold your attention just for a few moments. Moses walked up to the burning bush. Watching and beholding what a sight it was to see a bush that was burning and yet it did not consume. And when he walked up to the burning bush, he got orders. Take off your shoes, Moses, for the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. Moses obeyed by taking off his shoes. We notice one thing that when man have conferences of the nations, they get together and they find a big place and they, they feast and they have great dinners and they sit at the table and they have sociable drinks and they, and they get ready and, and go out from there to try to accomplish what they have selected in their minds to do. How different it is from God's conferences. Man don't come together in God's conferences to eat. They come together to fast and to pray and to receive orders and go forward with it. Moses coming on top of the mountain for at least 40 days. And he'd been up there getting the commandments. Or afterwards knew what it was to meet God. Know what it was to have a conference with God. So he waited his 40 days. It was easy after he'd once had a conference with God. Man who ever have a conference with God or women knows what it means to forsake food sometimes, forsake water, forsake the things of the world, forsake everything else to come apart with God to hold a conference. Moses on this first conference, the burning bush, he received orders from God. I'm the God of your fathers. And I've heard the cries of my people and I'm sending you down to deliver them. I want you to go down into Egypt. Look what simple reasons he used. Moses began to make excuses and said, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm slow of speech and so forth. So he told him that he'd be with him and the angel of God would go before him and signs and wonders that he would do. So he was ready then to go. After you have obeyed God and gone on the mission that He sent you on, sometimes we come into difficult circumstances. Moses hit that. He had went down into Egypt and had done just exactly what God told him to do. He had obeyed the Word to the letter and he was following the Word. God promised Abraham that his seed would sojourn in a strange country among strange people, but he would bring them back to that land after they had been captive 400 years. 
So Moses is perfectly in line with the Word of God. And even in that, you still hit obstacles. There may be some here tonight set up against that. Say, I'm sick, Brother Branham. I've been a Christian all my life. I've had the Holy Ghost for years. I've been a member of this church for so many years. I've, I've lived faithful to all that I've done. And here I am tonight. The doctor says that I must die. i got cancer. i got heart trouble. I'm in a wheelchair or something else. Those things happen. Moses was perfectly in line of duty of God and also in line of the Scripture. The first thing for a man to do to find out if something's went wrong is check himself. Or first, you're in the line of God's Word. Then the next thing, are you in line of duty following what the Holy Spirit told you to do? Then if that be so, then there's only one thing left. That's a conference. Moses had led the children of Israel by the hand of God from Egypt and had come to the Red Sea. We'll call this the Red Sea Conference. He was exactly in the line of duty, leading the children across to the Red Sea and was taking them to the Promised Land as God had promised. He had fell of a hair from God. The Holy Spirit was upon him. He had led them out done the miracles and signs of God, and here they was right in line of duty, and there every obstacle that could be shut off. It seemed as nature would even itself cry out, Oh, Moses and Israel, I feel sorry for you because doom just waits you. It might be that with you tonight. Doom just ahead. What did Moses do, this great runaway prophet? He had had one conference with God and he knew what it meant to him. He knew the only thing to do was have another conference. He selected him a place. Perhaps we'd say, oh, I don't know, maybe over behind this certain rock. He went over there and perhaps and knelt on his knees and said, Great Jehovah, I read in the Scriptures or by the word that I have that you're delivering your people. You sent an angel and spoke to me. And I'm strictly in the line of duty. And here we are at the Red Sea. And there's no way to get over. So I thought within myself there's only one thing to do. I'll never try to rely upon my intellectuals. I'll just come have a conference with you. God said, stand on your feet, Moses. Go speak to the children of Israel if they go forward. Never does God ever say retreat. There's no retreat in God. God is go forward. Hallelujah. No matter what stage of the battle you're in, if you backed up and said, I'm afraid of divine healing, I'm afraid of this, that, that, I'm afraid about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speak and go forward. Praise no retreat. Hallelujah. Don't come back. There's nothing to back up to. God is always go forward. If it's a line of duty, a line of His Word, go on, move on. Well, say, I know someone went into fanaticism, but that wasn't you. <laughs> Your duty is to go forward. Until God gets through with you, just keep moving forward. A few years ago, when the Lord called me, me a local Baptist pastor, to go preach divine healing, I never heard of such a thing as Pentecost. No more than I may have heard somebody says a bunch of holy rollers or something. But when he came and I seen him and he spoke, if God speaks, there's something got to respond to it somewhere. Whether my church believed it or not, there's somebody going to hear it. From there came Old Roberts and, the, and Tommy Osborne and so forth, and revival fires burn all over the world tonight. Why? Speaking, going forward. Don't back up. We're coming to kind of a slowdown. There's no place to slow down. If there's anything getting double geared, let's go forward. Amen. No stopping place. Hallelujah. Pentecost cannot stop. There's no place to stop. Let's not build a fire on the same ground. Anyone, two fires in two nights. Let's build a new fire here tonight and a new fire on up the road. On and on. Until we see Jesus, there's no stopping place now. Moses 
He prayed and he got orders. And he stepped down and asked the children of Israel to go forward. And the sea opened up. And they went through. God always makes the way. A conference. That's what the churches needs tonight. It's a conference. Get orders and move forward. You pray and ask if it's time now to lay the great blessing of this. It's went through in the last 30 or 40 years of Pentecost. Of the blessing of the Holy Spirit. The baptism that set the world afire. For revival has never been sent, sent, seen since the day of Pentecost in the beginning. They never had it in the Lutheran revival. They never had it in the Wesley revival. They've never had it in a no revival to this revival. It's not time for Pentecost to, to lay itself to seed. It's time to spread out its kids. It's time to go forward. Bring it in the brethren from every denomination, from every walk of life, and the message to burn forward. No time for stopping. If you're halt, let's call a conference. See what's wrong. When we get to a place that we think we're the only one that God can use, we better call a conference. God sent Jesus, His Son, to die for every member of the body of Christ. Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Catholic, whatever they may be, they're all God's children. A promise! How are they going to hear the message this week? If we cool off, what are we going to do? That we're putting a bad example before them. It's no time for cooling off. It's time for a warming up. We can't have a warming up till we have a conference, an old time revival that'll bring back the revival fires that'll attract the attention when sinners are born into the kingdom of God. Man begin to see ill-famed women and ill-famed men and sinners repenting and changing their life, going forth, making restitutions, weeping, bringing precious sheaves. The church needs a good case of old-time godly love, Amen. brotherly love. Amen. We need a conference. Hold a conference. Quickly, let's go to another conference. There was a Gethsemane conference. There's many we can mention. There's a conference one day in Babylon. Whether they should bow to the image of the king or whether they keep God's word. God sent the fourth person down on account of that conference. Daniel had to have a conference. And God sent an angel, maybe a pillar of fire or light, scared those animals off and they did not have the power over Daniel because it held a conference, a prayer meeting somewhere. That's what does the difference. When we get so wrapped up in the things of the world that we can't come to church on Sunday night or, or Monday night or any other night and have to watch our television programs and certain things like that, that shows that the world has leaked into us. What the Pentecostal church and all other churches need tonight is the lay aside of our weight and the sin that does easily beset us that we might run with patience the race that's set before us. We need a conference, a universal prayer meeting for the church of the living God to be called together. Don't think I am angry or beside myself. I know what I speak of. The need of the church tonight is a conference, a prayer meeting, a get together, a call together, ministers. Break down their middle wall of petition. Church members. That'll forget the differences between the denominations of churches. Church members and ministers. Hold to the hearts of the altar with one accord and pray until the fire of God begins to fall again. God knows the dump, the stubbornness and difference of man is broke up and godly fear and brotherly love takes its place in the human heart. Then you'll become salty. Then the message will have its preeminence in the heart. It'll have its influence in the city. We could scream and shout and do whatever we want to. It'll never influence man until they see the life of Christ being projected in you. Someone who's tender and merciful and forgiving and ready to, to be, turn the other side of the cheek or give the second quote or go the second mile. Christian anity and action. Not just talk from the pulpit, but acted among the members, among the pastors. 
That's when you see Christ living in the church. Decisions made. Jesus has brought himself to a decision. And before going to Calvary, the Father brought his own son in the conference. And Gethsemane, while angels taking their positions to see what the decision would be. Oh, it might not have been this way. But let's think maybe it was. I can hear him say, Son, do you desire to go on to Calvary? There's a band waiting for you. There's persecution. There's death and murder leading the way. There's exposure of your own body. They'll strip the clothes off of you. They'll beat you in the pump. They'll pull a crown of thorns over your head and you'll die screaming for mercy. Should you go on? Look at the decision. And sometimes when we're sitting in our seats and the Holy Spirit say, you must do this or you must do that. You've got someone you won't speak to you. You won't speak to them. You won't make it right. And you're just ashamed to go up and say, if you are in the wrong or well, if you're not in the wrong, to go up and say, brother, let's forget it and talk it over. Jesus, when he looked up into the face of the Father, he said, it's not my will, it's yours to be done. What a decision. That decision anchored and swept the world. Still comes tonight. They have repented its soul. Not my will, but thine be done. That's the decision. Of, there was a decision also. Made a Pentecostal decision. 120 went to the upper room. And they were waiting because of their... Their leader, their Lord, had ascended up into the heavens to the Father. And he had told them, he said, Now, you wait up to the city of Jerusalem. And I don't want you to go out preaching yet. I don't want you to have any schooling. You don't need any more theology. But I want you to go up there and just wait there till you get one accord. Then I can send the decision of heaven back to you. That's what's the matter today. That's what's the matter with our churches today. Amen. What's the decision for this hour? Looky here when Khrushchev and when the communists the other day could take a little bottle of medicine and shake it in the face of the world, an atheist, ungodly, God-hating nation, and say, we can take a paralytic and pour this into him and he'll straighten up again. What a disgrace! Although I'm thankful for anything that can be done to help the sick. I don't discredit that. But deliverance wasn't given to infidels. It was given to the ministry of the Lord God. Amen. The church of the living God has deliverance with them. It doesn't come from a bottle. It comes from Calvary. Amen. What's the matter? There's something wrong. We need a conference. The church needs to come together. The people need to come together. And wait with one accord until the decision comes. They're trying to build bomb shelters down on the ground, 400 feet, and make it out of steel. Why the concussion of one of those bombs that blows a hole in the ground 175 feet deep for 150 square miles? Well, there's no way to dig out of it. There's only one way to get out of it. It's go up out of it. Amen. Conferences. How deep we must go. How much enforced concrete and other things that won't that well, won't be worth that. We're at the coming of the Lord. Amen. The church needs to be called together in a conference. Come one card. Wait to see what the decision of God is. Oh Lord, what must we do? We've come down now. We've preached the gospel. We spoke with tongues. We've had interpretations. We've had signs and wonders and miracles in our church. But we've come to a place to we're halting. Now the. The communists shake a bottle in front of us. Say, we got it here. Jesus himself said, Verily I say to you, if you say to this mountain, be moved and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you said will come to pass, you can have what you've said. Amen. 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 What's the matter then? A conference. That's what we need. A conference. One a car and a conference. They waited. They wanted to see how the church should be conducted. They wanted to see whether it should be conducted by intellectual conceptions of good moral living, 
whether they should conduct it upon the basis of, of certain uh, sprinklings or forms of baptisms or what must they do? How must the new Christian church be conducted? And there was a conference held in heaven. How they must do? Carry a pad of paper with them and take everybody's name down, give them communion and send them on. Was that it? But they were waiting with one accord in one place. That was Pharisees, Sadducees, all the rest of them. The little things of their denominations have been broke down. Their sect and so forth of their other religious teachings had been broke down. They would call to a conference by Jesus Christ. There they were waiting with one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. Like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared to them cloven tongues like fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began speaking with other languages as the Spirit gave them. My friends, there were Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, had gathered there at Jerusalem. And this is all noise abroad. They came together and were confounded because they heard every man speaking in his own language where he was born. That was God's decision of how the church must be run. Brother, we capitalize upon the things of God. And make it just our group is the only ones. Got it. It's time to call another conference. Get back to God again. And hear another sound like a rushing mighty wind. To see brotherly love. We hear so much today about Christians has got to be millionaires. You have to own a fleet of Cadillacs or you're not spiritual. How far that is. I was speaking to a group of men here a few nights ago. That has spread propaganda across the world on books and so forth that you must uh, be- become a Christian and your business flourish and everything, which that's good. God will do that. But what we need today is not a flourishing business. What we need today is a testimony of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ Amen. as a living witness. Hallelujah. How contrary that is from real Pentecost. You've got to live in a better neighborhood today. You've got to do this. You've got to dress this way or be that way. That's all right. I believe Christianity is much soap and water as you've got to make you keep yourself clean. That's right. Physically. And of course, the Holy Spirit's there at will spiritually. But brother, that still isn't what I'm talking about. What they did that day, instead of trying to boast on how much of the worldly fame they had, they sold everything they had <laughs> and to distribute it amongst the poor. A certain fellow raised up when I said this. He said, Brother Bram, that's the greatest mistake the church ever made. Let him do that. So why you get that? He said, because when the persecution arose, they had no homes to go to. And they were scattered everywhere. I said, exactly the will of God. Because yeah. then they had no place to go, no worldly possessions. They went forth preaching everywhere. And the word of the Lord grew. God's decisions is always right. That's right. Went forth everywhere preaching. That's why he had scattered in the Word. The Pentecostal conference. Well, not to be upon this certain bunch or certain sect, but whosoever will, let him come. That's what Peter said. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's where it's far. For whosoever will, let him come. For he might drink from the fountains of the water of the Lord. Now there was another conference, and we're coming to a close to this last conference. There's a conference that arose after they were scattered abroad everywhere preaching. And two of them went up to the gate called Beautiful, and there laid a lame man that was sick, crippled from his mother's womb. And he was lame in his feet. And Peter and John said, Look on us. And he did. And he said, Silver and gold have I none. That's still. But such as I have, would you trade that for silver and gold? Would you trade that for a name of popularity? Would you trade that for a television show on Sunday night or Monday night, Tuesday night, whenever it was, when your church has got services going on? That's what's the matter today. Boston said this, if this isn't that, then I'll keep this till that comes. Peter said, I have silver and your gold, but such as I have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man hesitated a little, and Peter grabbed him by the arms, him and John, and lifted him up. His ankle bones received strength. He began leaping and praising God. It did something to the congregation. They tucked them in and whipped them and threatened them. 
that they should no more preach in such a name. No more scatter that heresy of Pentecost any farther. So when they did that, they went out with that threat that they'd be thrown into prison if they preached it again. Said anything about the Jesus being raised and the Holy Ghost shared performing miracles. You know what they done? They were in trouble. There was an emergency. So they went to their own company. That's where we want to go tonight. Not go out and ask the mayor of the city how we should do this or how we should do that. We shouldn't stand off to some school of education and ask how we must do this or how that we must do that. If our church is getting lean in the spirit, the thing we should do is hold a conference with God. Acts 4, they held a conference. And they preached and they prayed like this. Lord, why did the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Is it right for us to refuse to preach divine healing in our messages? Should we preach divine healing? Or should we refrain from such a thing? Oh, Lord, we know what your word says. Then give us boldness, courage. Amen. Then the house was shook where they were assembled together. What an answer. Give us a conference like that, Tone Levens and Garfield. We'll preach the full word of God. We'll stand on everything that God said stand. We'll believe in being dead from sin and alive in Christ. We believe that a, a man that's dead from sin refrains from the things of the world because they're dead to him. No more gossips and pouts and fusses and fights and stews. He's at peace with God and with the church from that till the day he's taken out of the world. I believe that the Holy Spirit kills the nature of the world in a man or a woman. Yes, sir. I believe that divine healing is right. I believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is just as great today as it was when it was poured out at Pentecost. I believe it breaks down the walls of petition and brings up brotherly love that the devil and all the tears of the world can't separate us from the love of God that's in Christ. We need a conference, a real conference, to bring us together in this kind. There's another conference coming, and that's a conference of judgment. Now, you might not have been at the Big Four, neither was I. You might not have been at the Geneva, neither was I. Uh, brother, sister, let me say this to you as your brother. That one, you're going to be there. Every time that ambulance screams out there on the street, it lets you know that you're going to be there too. Every time you pass by the graveyard and see a tombstone, something tells you you're going to that conference. Every time you hear the warning voice of your pastor across this pulpit, it tells you you're going to the judgment. Every time you comb your hair and see the gray, or it falling, the wrinkles in your face, your eyes dimming, what is it? You're going to judgment. You're going to be at that conference. Just remember that. You've got to be there, young or old, right or wrong. You're going to stand there. Some men's sins go before them. Some follow. The conference we need tonight in America, as same as here at Phoenix, and across the world everywhere is a conference of an old-fashioned prayer meeting of a place of where we can get back to the place where brotherly love exists, where the Spirit of God can come into our hearts and make us so miserable for the things out here that's going on in the world. You know, the sealing angel said, put a mark upon those who sigh and cry for the abominations that's did in the city while the investigation judgment's going on to see who is worthy to escape the wrath. The angel was to seal only those who cried inside for the abominations done in the city. Now, Mark Phoenix tonight. This is where the conference is held. We've come here for that purpose, to hold a conference here at, at, this, at this church. We've come to reason among you. God said, come, let us reason together. Yeah. No matter what you have done, let's, let's forget that and start right now. Although judgment is coming... All will be there. Who has rejected or who has refused? No matter what you've done, you're going to that conference and you're going to have to appear there before Christ to give an account of your life, how you spent it. There might be some say, well, look here, Brother Bram. I'm an old man or an old woman. I'm, I'm in Sernisket. I was born in a home that didn't believe in God. 
I don't care how insignificant it may be, how little you may be, how old you may be, how sinful you may be, how many times you've tried to receive the Holy Spirit, how many times you've tried to repent, how many times you've tried to do right and fail, there's still hope for you as long as God's knocking at your door. I don't care how many churches you've joined, how many mistakes, how much fanaticism, how much this of you or that you've done, there's still hopes as long as God knocks at the door. Conference. I believe tonight and I pray that right in this audience, right now, that angels of God will take their places around this building. Let's hold a conference. What if you die tonight? Or what if somebody runs in the door and says, John Doe, I have a message here for you. Oh, what is that? I'm John Doe. I have an order here. You inherit a million dollars. Oh, that would be grand. But you might die before you ever get it. You might say, how do I know I've got a million dollars? Well, here's a, oh, here's a postal order. Here's a, from the government shows before this can be written, this order. There has to be a million dollars on deposit before this can be written. I said, well, what are you hollering about? You just got a piece of paper. But you say, look what it is. Look on here. Here's the postal clerk's name, if such could be written. A million dollars on deposit here. It's in the bank. I don't care what you've got against you. You may have cancer. You may be, you may be sin sick. You may have demon possession. I don't care what you've got. I've got a message here for you. Screaming across this pulpit as hard as I can. There's pardon. There's grace. There's healing. There's forgiveness. There's love. There's joy. There's peace. You say, why are you so enthused about it, Brother Brennan? It's written. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Come, let us reason together. But you say, I'm unworthy. I know you are. But Jesus died for you. In our fair city, our city near us, the other day there was an accident happening. An old bum was crossing the street. He looked like his clothes was ragged. His old hat was tattered. And a young teenage boy and girl coming down the street making love to each other. And there wasn't noticing the poor old fella. And they hit him and knocked him way back up and smashed him the side of a building when the fender side swiped him. As the boy turned from the girl to see the old man, he swung sideways and crushed him upside of a building. The emergency was called and they took him over to the hospital, the city hospital. And they looked him over and there his arms was broke, his legs was broke, in his... They thought he was unconscious. He wasn't even hardly breathing. So a bunch of doctors, they thought about others they had, and they said, we should hold a little conference here. Now the old man is nearly 70, no doubt. We don't know, know who he is. It'll take us hours after hours of our time to operate, set his bones back again, and try to straighten him up. And the old fellow doesn't have very much longer to live, and we've got others waiting out here. I just don't believe it's worthwhile to do it. Let's just lay him back and it won't be too long till he'll be gone anyhow. But the old man wasn't as dead as they thought he was. He turned himself over. He said, gentlemen, I've heard every word you said. He said, I am worth something. He said, I was worth so much so God gave his only begotten son. That I would be saved. And he said, I received that message some 50 years ago. And as passing tracks on the street, I walk from place to place trying to preach the gospel. He said, I'm worth something. Our God would have never saved me. Sure you are. Angels of God are here. I don't care what you've done, though your sins be as scarlet. They'll be white like wool. Oh, they'll be red like crimson. They shall be white like snow. Let's hold a conference. Each one where you're at. And ask God Oh, Lord, am I worth anything? I'm just a little housewife. I, I'm just a farmer. I, I work at a filling station. I don't care what you do. But you see, Lord, I, I've been evil. I, I made three or four shows and fell. I don't care what you've done. Let's hold a conference. Though your trials has failed, though you, your intellectuals has passed away, God's got a burning bush right by every seat here tonight. He's got an angel that can set your heart afire. Come, let us reason together. Let's start here from Leavens and Garfield. Let's start, you Christians, and let's us hold a conference. Let's hold a conference, Lord. My life will soon be over. Jesus will soon come. We're going to get to those messages this coming week, Lord willing. That second coming, and how close. Now, and what must I do? 
Maybe I've just got this week to work, and that'll be the last that I'll ever have time to work. Let's hold a conference now and see what the Holy Spirit would say. While we bow our heads everywhere, inside and out, as far as the piano there, who it is, we'll, we'll go to the piano just a moment. Now, while you're praying, may the Holy Spirit, in His goodness and mercy and His tenderness, come down to you and say, Child of mine, that's me talking to you. I, I'm going to speak to you just a moment. I, I know that you feel you're, you're condemned. And I, I want to take you a little closer to me. You don't want to come empty-handed. You don't want to come with sin on your conscience. You want to come with, your, with happiness and peace and joy in your heart. While we have our heads bowed and our eyes closed, each one of you now, a little private conference with God while we wait. Though your sins be as scarlet, yet they shall be white like snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white like wool. We say, Brother Bram, it's sickness that I've got. That a little faith right now will settle the whole thing. It's just a little sin not to believe. What is sin? Unbelief. He that believeth not is condemned already. Let's find a little conference. The other day I laid sick, couldn't even whisper for nine days. And I heard something in my room and I looked up. And there stood someone dressed in white. I seen a Bible open and a cross came out of it. And out of the cross came Jesus. And he told me what I was fixing to go into and it was wrong. And oh, that conference, the sweetness. One second later, I called my wife, and she's so scared she dropped the blankets in the floor, the sheets. She's coming to change my bed. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it different. Now, inside and out, with your heads bowed, how many like to be remembered tonight in closing prayer of the message? Would you raise your hand? God bless you. you God be with you. Outside, would you just want to hold your hand? God sees there's no darkness or dark but what he can see. Yes, 150, 200, maybe more hands have went up. There's no way for us to make an altar call here. The altar is full of little children. But the just keep thinking. Now, to you that's sick, would you raise your hand and say, "Lord, let me have, let me talk it over with you right now." God bless you. Right? 150 or more of those. Or maybe that many. All right. Whatever the conference is, no matter. If thou believest. Our Heavenly Father, in the sacredness and sweetness of this minute, that may mean the difference between death and life to many people. We cannot see outside standing in the churchyards, but around the building, inside, over the audience, we see many hands, many of those calling for salvation, many of those wanting to be saved and filled with your Spirit. And then there was many raise your hands for sickness. And we've been through the conferences, Lord, of that upon the Word, we ministers. And we have orders from you. Preach the word. That's why they call us full gospel preachers. We preach the whole word, the whole counsel of God. We believe he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. We believe that so, Lord. We're settled in that in our heart. No matter what they have done, Though their sins be as scarlet, you promised if they'd come and reason together. Now, Lord, we realize we haven't got much more time. We see everything moving right at the door. And, and we don't know how long we'll live ourselves. May not through the night. We do not know. But we have the blessed promise of Jesus saying, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life. And shall never come into the judgment, 
But it says, Pass from death unto life. Lord, if there be anything in me, as I stand here at the pulpit, over this sacred spot where the gospel has been preached so long, where great servants of yours have wept this altar wet with tears, try me, Lord, I want a conference. And you promised that I could have it with the Father if we would ask in your name. And each of us are holding conferences inside and out. May we hear the burning of the Holy Spirit. May we feel the impact of his presence that tells us our sins are forgiven. And though they were like crimson, they shall be white like wool. And our unbelief and frustrations and our indifference and and little petty thoughts will all pass from us and we'll become a great united church of the living God. Every denomination together, every heart, all with one accord, marching forward, undivided upon the principles of the Lord Jesus and upon his teachings, upon his spirit that's bringing us to that day of the judgment. May we confess our sins now and they go before us. Those who are sick and afflicted that your children all sins has been forgiven and they're, they're washed in the water by the word or the water of separation or the waters of separation, the word. And has divided them, Lord, from, from the wrong to the right and has forgiven them. May the Holy Spirit right at this moment, Lord, touch their sick bodies. May they rise from their sickness, go out tomorrow to be different, to be at work with the Lord somewhere, doing his bidding. Grant it, Lord. Bless every minister, your shepherds, Lord. Oh, Lord, bless their precious hearts. Shepherds of these flocks around through the country here, Lord, may their churches just begin to prosper. May the cause of Christ begin to grow. Grant it, Lord. Bless this pastor here, our, our dear brother. We ask that you'll just bless him abundantly and all of his staff and his church and his members. May there be hundreds of additions to the fellowship granted, Lord, because of the presence of Christ. Forgive us of every sin and take us into thy keeping. Now, while we have our heads bowed, the pastor just whispered in my ear, if these that raise your hands want special attention, they can certainly get it in a side room here. If you want a special attention, if you just raise to your feet, walk over here to my right, We'll take you over here in the room, those who need a special attention from Christ. It doesn't feel sufficient just now that you have received that, what you've asked for. The doors are open. We'd be glad to have you to come in so we could counsel with you while we softly sing real so you come home. Is that what you're saying, sister? Now keep your heads bowed and pray. Now you that raise your hands, that doesn't feel that you have just what you want from Christ, Right to my right, right here, there's a place fixed so we can minister. Pray now. Softly and tenderly, as you come by, won't you come right to the altar so I'll be sure to touch each one for you and for me. See on the board of Watching for you and for me. conference sitting in your seat there settled so glad to know that it did 
I wouldn't think that you were honest enough to raise your hand if you wanted something from God and then not honest enough to refuse it if it was given to you. I believe you have received it. God ever bless you. Oh, we remain with our heads bowed. I'm going to ask the pastor now to say a word. Praise